Good afternoon, everyone. So excited to have everyone here together again. If you've been participating in this series, good to have be in the same space with you again. I've had the opportunity and the privilege of being in these sessions for or for for several of the sessions, and just want to acknowledge, like I know that you know, looking at the things that are going on in our country, in our world, this is a heavy day. It's a hard day, um, and we're hoping, like even as we're holding that space together and knowing that we're you know we're facing a lot, um, we've been facing a lot for a long time. But I just really appreciate you honoring us with your time on a day like today, where we'll get together and just be engaging and learning together. So thank you so much for that. I'll go ahead and, and, and welcome us into the series. So welcome to the CASA UCLA CCEE Advancing Equity in an Era of Crisis webinar series. The California Association of African American Superintendents and Administrators, CASA, and the University of California Los Angeles Center for the Transformation of Schools put this project together to support equity in virtual learning as we all shelter in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This work has been made possible by the generous support of the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, CCEE. We are grateful for their partnership on behalf of California's K-12 public school students. At the end of our session today, I'm going to share a link to a survey with you that we really hope that you take the time to respond to because we, I know this is, we are at our last week of the, of the series and we continue to be invested in and interested in your feedback. So we make sure that whether it be the series for the rest of this week or future opportunities are responsive to the needs of our of you as our participants and if you're watching this as a recording later on you still have access to the survey so please go ahead and share your feedback with us i'll share that link at the end of the session additionally um we're gonna um engage in such a powerful session today and we'll be, we'll be having opportunities for you to share questions in the chat that we will engage with as as much as we're able to if there are questions that arise for you that we're not able to address during the session or if as you're marinating on what you learned today after today's session you have questions that you want to answer i'll also send a link to you in the chat of um to the ask the experts portal where you'll be able to share your questions and then someone who has experience with the topic will respond to you in 48 hours and then also i will send a link at the end to the um, website where you'll be able to find the recording of today's session and also the session resources that are shared today as you engage um, in the chat we do ask that you send your your message through so all all panelists and attendees so that everyone will be able to see whether it be resources that you share or questions or comments that you want to share with the group. Um, so that's all of the overall information about the session. So now let me tell you about today's session in particular. Today we have the privilege, hopefully if, if you've been here before, you've gotten to hear from LeBron James before, but today well, our session is called Ethnomathematics, Unlocking the Gates to College and Careers in the 21st Century. And LeBron James is a Chief Educational Officer at Stimulate Learning LLC. I'm going to go ahead and, ch and, and pass the mic over to LeBron now, but I will be here throughout the session monitoring the chat and, and, and sharing your questions with LeBron as we go through, and then I'll close this out at the end. All right. Thank you. I'm passing on to you, LeBron. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Africa. Uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, to this session, Ethnomathematics, um, and we'll define that term for those who may not have heard that term before. Uh, once again, my name is LeBron James. Just some quick background. Um, I have a math degree from uh, this school right here, UCLA, and I was a classroom teacher for 15 years, teaching everything from algebra one up to calculus. And I've been in this math game for over 30 years, <clears throat> primarily with a focus on how do you teach math to students of color and how do you engage students. Uh, and so even though this is a difficult time right now for obvious reasons, we're about to have a good time uh, discussing uh, and talking about math and strategies to help kids learn online. And I welcome your, your thoughts in the chat. Mm -hmm. And then also I'll be asking at times for you to share your voice in the room because I think it's important for us to share our voices mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the room. But in order to get this thing started, I have to do it in an ethno-mathematics way. So please join me as we get this thing started. Alrighty, thank you so much. And so now we can go ahead and get this party started. First thing I want to do is show you this slide here. Uh, this is a flyer. They're trying to recruit more women into the field of mathematics. So I'm wondering, looking at this, uh, what do you notice and what do you wonder about this particular flyer? And if you have any thoughts about it, if you could please put them in the in the chat, I'd appreciate it.
<laughs> yes, Melissa. All men, all white. Exactly. You all get it. I know I was with a sharp group. I'm with my folks here. So, and this is one of the biggest challenges in mathematics is that we look at math through one very narrow lens. It's usually through the white male European Eurocentric perspective that doesn't even include people of color or women. So even as they're trying to recruit women in math, they put four men on the flyer. And so to me, that deters, it would, it would deter me as a woman to want to do math. And the reason I focus on ethnomathematics is because being a black man in the math world, it's a very lonely, lonely, isolating experience. And so as a math major at UCLA, <clears throat> There were 3,000 math majors in the math department at UCLA, and only five of us were black. And so in that, there was all kind of challenges and things. And you don't, if you don't see yourself on the wall, if you don't see yourself in the book, if you don't have a professor who understands your background, you become isolated. You become depressed. You become, you feel like you have imposter syndrome in mathematics. So it's easy for someone to see me as an athlete because that's the lens you're usually used to seeing me through. But as a mathematician, it's difficult for people to see me through that lens. And so not only do I have to deal with the math, I have to deal with people's math perceptions and perceptions about my math ability. But we'll talk about that more. So I want to share that first, uh, this first slide. So I want to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about for about the next hour. Um, really, we're going to talk about equity and mathematics. We're gonna talk about uh, how do we make math classes online more engaging and culturally relevant for students that we serve. And also understand that math is emotional. Not only do we have to deal with the stuff above the neck, the intellectual aspects related to mathematics, but we have to deal with below the neck, the emotional connection people have to mathematics. And in this session today, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, my theory and philosophy that has worked for me for the last 15, 20 years. And then I'm also going to show you a video clip of me teaching it. Because for me, I go to math seminars and workshops and people give me all this theory and try this and try that. But I never get to see it in practice. I'm like, show me you doing that. What does that actually look like? So I have a, like a five minute clip of me teaching a math class online. In fact, 30 minutes ago, I just got through teaching a math class online that I'm doing for Pasadena Unified School District, where I have uh, 30 Latino students that I'm teaching Algebra 1, 2 online. And just the way I started the class with you, uh, with the music, I started with them with Bruno Mars, 24 Karat, built relationship, talked to the kids, uh, checked in on them. And so um, I don't talk about math. I be about the math. I do what I say I do. And so I want to show you at least a five-minute clip of my, my practice. And then I also have another clip of students giving feedback on this methodology because I realized that you have to see it in action in order to really understand. And then I really want to get your, your feedback and thoughts um, on the teaching style and the things I shared. I'm not saying everything I'm doing is correct, but it's a different lens. It's a different perspective that I would really like you at least to consider uh, as you're teaching math and, and transitioning online. <clears throat> so in order to have this conversation, I want us to, um, in this safe space, to really um, practice these four agreements um, from Glenn Singleton in his book, Courageous Conversations, that if you have something to share, whether in chat or speaking to me, to please speak your truth. Your truth is your truth. And so I always begin by saying, in my experience. So when I say in my experience, anything following that cannot be argued. Uh, as truth. It is truth. It's my truth. It's my experience. You may agree or disagree, but it's still my truth. So I want you all to be able to speak your truth and also to stay engaged. Uh, times, uh, times when things get difficult, people try to disengage when things may move into an area that, uh, of discomfort. Uh, and speaking of discomfort, uh, I hope that you experience some discomfort because through the discomfort, that's where the learning happens. If everything you hear today is something you've already heard, it's been a, it will be a waste of your time uh, and ours. And so there should be some discomfort because of the inequities that exist 
in education. And the only way we're going to move forward is to lean into the discomfort. And then the last thing is to expect and accept non-closure. We're not going to uh, fix things today. We won't have all the answers today, but um, we can accept that we're on a path and on a journey and on a continuum and that we have to continue to do the best that we can. Now, I want to define equity uh, in order to make a shift towards change. So here, this is one um, definition of equity that I discussed uh, in an earlier session uh, with my partner, Ann Watkins. Hello, Ann. Uh, so this is uh, one of the definitions of equity. I really want to focus uh, on a couple of parts about A and B. Part A is eliminating the barriers. So how do we eliminate barriers for people to give them access, in this case, to the math? Uh, and Part B, providing equal educational opportunities uh, to, to the historically underserved and underrepresented. And so equal educational opportunities is, is sort of a loaded term to me. Because what, how do, at what point is it equal? Giving every student the same curriculum is not equal creating equal educational opportunities. You're going to have to provide additional resources and services to some students uh, that other students won't have because they've already um, are on the on the positive side of the inequity. So for remember, for every underserved student in America, there's a student who's overserved and overrepresented. And so I don't think we talk about those students enough. And, and one of the things I want to say now before I forget, in terms of part A, about eliminating educational barriers. Being an education consultant, I go into schools and train teachers how to make math engaging for students of color, how to practice ethnomathematics. And the biggest barrier they have is demanding that kids know their times tables. I can't go on to algebra because these kids can't multiply, they can't divide. I'm like, get rid of the barrier people it's real simple give them a damn calculator everybody got a calculator ti calculator they sell 100 million dollars for the calculator a year so somebody's using calculators we got google when you don't know something you google it so move past kids having to memorize the times tables give them a calculator remove that barrier and let's teach them how to think i don't care if you know how to multiply uh, add, subtract, multiply, or divide. But I do care, do you know when to multiply, why to multiply, uh, the relationship between multiplication and division, how to solve a problem. That's what I care about. I don't care if you actually know that six times five is 30. Because if you give a kid a calculator, if they do six times five is 30, by the third day, they'll remember six times five is 30. When they know it, they'll stop using the calculator. So let's try to eliminate some of those barriers for these kids. And so now I want to talk about ethnomathematics. Um, this is a term that comes out of Hawaii and basically talks about um, how math is universal. Two plus two is four everywhere. But how you teach it and how you learn it is cultural. And that's the part we miss. The math itself is universal, but how we teach it and learn it and how we use it, that is cultural. And every teacher who teaches is coming from a cultural lens or cultural perspective. And if you don't attune to the culture of the students in your classroom, you will miss the boat and they will miss that math experience. And also people, students need to see themselves in the mathematics, it needs to be reflective. So if I don't see anyone who looks like me doing math, <clears throat> you can teach me all day long. I'm not trying, I ain't feeling you. Because no one who looks like me is doing the math. <clears throat> and so, like I said, ethnomathematics is used to express the relationship between culture and mathematics. And, and one thing that really made me understand this, ironically, is I was a private school math teacher. I taught at, a, at an all-Jewish school. So it was 700 Jewish students and me at the school. And when I got hired, the rabbi was like, LeBron, you know the math, but what do you know about the Jewish culture? I was like, uh, what does I have to do with mathematics? They say, in order to teach at our school, you got to understand our culture. So you got to practice Shabbat. You got to um, study uh, the Torah after school. 
we have to go to some bar mitzvahs. You need to be a part of our community and know our culture in order to teach us math. And I was like, bam, they get it. But that same thing is not true when we're talking about black and brown kids. How often do we demand that their math teachers or any teachers understand their culture, understand um, uh, the norms in their family, their belief systems, and how they can integrate that into their teaching? So that's why ethnomathematics is so important. Because if you see kids are struggling with math, it's because they don't give a damn, not that they can't do the math. It's like, how is this math going to help us pay rent? How is this math going to help us keep the, keep the lights on? How is this math going to get this nerdy boy to get the, the, the star cheerleader to go on the prom date with me? The kids don't care about what we're talking about. If you don't make the math relatable to their world, they disconnect. They're a different generation than us. We, we did what we were told. But now that we live in the information age, kids need to know why. Tell me why, why do I need this math? And so as, an, as a math educator, I always survey my students first to figure out what's happening in your life. What's the latest uh, website that's going on? What's the latest music? Uh, what's happening on Instagram or Snapchat? Give me that information so I can connect that to the math and give you a why in terms of why you need to learn this information. And so I'm gonna pause right here to see if there are any questions or anybody have any questions or comments uh, at this point? I'm looking in the uh, chat. You, oh yeah, yep, go ahead. Yeah. What was say? yeah, yeah, and I'm saying, uh, if, you, if you do wanna raise your hand, you can raise your hand and I'll take one or two, two comments at this point. Yeah, someone uh, had their hand raised a bit earlier, but I think I think they put their hand down, but it seems like a lot of folks, there was tons of excitement around like that image, just like, like a picture speaks a thousand words, right? About like okay. women in math and seeing all white men like that. So there was a lot of resonance in there when you asked about that. Um, but okay. yeah, so it's like a lot of folks agreeing with, um, you know, beautiful point, how to connect students' culture, current issues with math. Okay. And the, the why gives kids a great aha. I haven't, I don't see any other hands up though. Okay, then I'll, yeah. I'll keep, I'll keep on with my, um, uh, with my sermon. I mean, my, um, my lecture right here. <laughs> it's a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so a couple right. of questions did come through. You want me to say those questions? Yeah, yeah, just let me know, yeah. Okay, yeah, so one question came through. Oh, you know how I like when the questions come through and it shifts. I'm trying to get to stay still. How do you respond to the why question when it may be different for different students in the same class? Oh, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. And so uh, why well, answer the why, one in the general sense, and then if I know the student, then I'll tell them, here's how it can apply in your life in general. And when all else fails, I tell them, why do you learn to read? So, you know, kids don't say, oh, why do we have to read? Why do I have to learn reading? Why do I have to learn how to write? We accept that. But when we tell them you need to learn how to do math problems, then they somehow see that there's some kind of disconnect. So I tell them that every day for the rest of your life, you will have problems. You have a few big problems and a lot of small problems, but you will have problems every day of your life. And so to live a productive, healthy life, you need to learn how to solve problems. So it's not about math, it's about how do you solve problems? How do you see patterns or recognize patterns and say, okay, I had this challenge last year, now I see this thing about to happen again, now I can change or make a shift. Or how do I predict, um, what's going to happen in the future by reading this graph or interpreting this information. So it's about empowering yourself to solve problems and to have strategies. So all math does is it gives you a game of different ways of practicing how to solve problems. And that's usually how I answer uh, the why question. Uh, because when I was a kid, I asked my mom, mom, why do I have to do the math? She said, because I said so. Do so. <laughs> that, was the, that was the only response I got as a kid. So. We have to give a little bit more uh, these days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And then the, another yeah. question came through is, how do we get, do oh man, it shifted again, hold on. How do we get dominant culture teachers to learn the culture of their students rather than forcing assimilation? It's a big question. <laughs> wow, Ooh, that is a big one. That's a big one. That's like, like how do I get- webinar, webinar of its own, right? That's a whole nother <laughs> webinar, right. And so it's really incumbent on those in power to understand that you have to be human. 
See, the only problem in education is we don't act like human beings. We treat black and brown kids as though we're not human. And so, but the person who's inhumane is the person inflicting the pain or the inequity on the student. So if you're a human being, then it's easy to connect. So if I have a child, I have two sons, I ask them, how, what, what way can I communicate to you that's going to be most uh, effective for you? How do you want, are you a visual learner? Should we talk about it? Do we write it? Do we do an activity? And so it's the same thing you have to ask the students, but the teacher has the power, but has to relinquish that power and give it to the students. And if you give it to the students, ironically, what I've learned is the students will give it right back along with respect. But as long as you think I'm the authority, they're going to be like, okay, we're going to rebel. And that's the experience that I've, I've typically seen. And so I want to give now uh, just a few strategies on how to shift to online math equity. The first thing, if you're teaching online, less is more. That once you're on the online environment, whatever your lesson plan was, you either cut it in half or cut it in a third and only do that. So do fewer concepts and go deeper, providing more examples. That's how math instruction is more effective online. And to also use the 80-20 rule. So currently I'm teaching an algebra class, summer algebra class, like I said, for Pasadena Unified School District. And I told the people when they hired me, I said, I'm only teaching 20% of the concepts in algebra. I'm only gonna teach kids a few concepts and I'm gonna go deep and make sure they get it. But the concepts I show, those 20%, they show up in 80% of all problems. So if these kids know these few skills, any problem you show them, they will know how to do at least half the problem already because they have those four or five skills mastered. You always have to combine like terms in math. So first thing you look, oh, okay, these things look like, I don't know what kind of problem this is, but they're like terms. There's always order of operations. So there's a few skills you need to have in algebra that will guide you all the way through and it will show up time and time again. Also, coherence, the shift in the school schedule. Now we have to understand that if you are teaching geometry, you got to talk to the algebra one teacher and say, hey, I need these four skills no matter what. Whatever you're teaching, give me these four skills so when I get them in geometry, I can move them forward. And then as a geometry teacher, I have to talk to the algebra two teacher and say, hey, what four skills do, I, do you, that are mandatory that I must teach and have these kids know so that when I give them to you, you can pick up from there. So there's gotta be a conversation, constant conversation between um, all levels of mathematics in order to create a path for students that'll be smooth. And so we need to have that conversation, especially now in the online environment because if you think we were siloed before we are super siloed now and so teachers are so stressed and trying to figure this out and how do i upload this and how do i grade that there's really little time for teachers to still collaborate so math departments should be having zoom sessions about look during this this time of online learning and quarantining everybody pick three concepts you're going to focus on and that's it let's pick those out and then let's coordinate and then that's all we're going to do. We're not going to stress these kids out and we're going to make this as entertaining and engaging as possible. And then the last one is rigor. This is the big elephant in the room. And so teachers struggle with rigor in the classroom. So I'm seeing a lot more teachers struggle with it even more online. So of course, we always do part B. We give them the procedural skills. We hand out the worksheets, the CUDA math worksheets. And we, we coup to math and worksheet kids to death, but they're still not learning math at a high level. You have to give them conceptual understanding. And that's the elephant in the room. Anytime you tell me kids are two or three years behind in math, it's because whoever was their teacher didn't teach them the concept. You got to have a hook, you know, giving them a hook for them to put that jacket on. You're just giving them worksheets so they just throw the, the clothes on the ground. They just fall on the ground. So unless I conceptually understand what's going on, I can't retain that information. And then also we have to get to more word problems because that is gonna be the deciding factor. Can kids solve word problems? Even simple one-step word problems, but these are things we have to focus on. And so here's my suggestion. Whenever I'm teaching a kid online, I show them the concept and then I go to Google 
and then we Google the concept. And then I go to images. I click images, so they see images of the concept. And then we go to YouTube and watch a YouTube clip of somebody showing that. So you got to give them the concept. You got to show them an image, something visual, and then you have to have two or three voices they can hear teaching that concept. That's how we're going to move to equity uh, in math online. And then you use that in concert with the instruction that you already give. And now here's why I said give the damn kids a calculator. Because as kids move into the 21st century, Fortune 500 companies have a different demand of skills than they did in the 20th century. In the 20th century, the left-hand column, you see computation skills were important. Uh, 21st century, computation skills are not important at all because we got Google and calculators. However, teamwork is important. Problem solving is important. Emotional intelligence, oral communication. So all of these are the skills we should be building in students in our math classes. So now looking at these shifts in the math discussion, we looked at focus using the 80-20 rule, less is more, coherence, um, a struggle between uh, communicating between teachers, and then rigor. Are we making sure kids can do high level math? So I'm just wondering um, which one of these is the most challenging to you? So if you could put that in the chat, which one's most challenging to you of those three? And if there's uh, one or two people who would like to share, I'd love to get your voice in the room. Uh, you can just raise your hand and we'll let you speak. I'm not sure if I'm saying this name right. Daridan has had their hand raised for a little bit, but I don't know if it's in response to your question that you just asked. Okay. I'm sorry, I'll just okay. keep an eye on the chat. Okay, go ahead and I'll let, allow them to speak. Can you bring him into the... He's, he's, he's on his way in. Okay, Maybe. okay, good. All right. Dr. James, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, in response to your question, I think I can, can uh, sort of shape this question based on that. So the focus, the coherence, and the rigor, what I was thinking is, is, is as a district administrator, how should I be thinking about or what have you seen in practice where district administrators who are responsible for sort of scaled school improvement all the way down to the classroom, how should they be thinking about how do they scale and potentially spread this way of thinking about math so that it becomes systematized as a part of the way that they do math as opposed to maybe potential individual efforts that may work for particular classrooms but doesn't scale it to a system level where it's impacting across the district fantastic fantastic question thank you for that and so and system change is what we're looking for one thing i would say is that first everyone in say your math department has to have the same understanding of rigor Traditionally, teachers think of rigor as, I give the most difficult problems and I don't help kids. That's not rigor. Rigor means that you, there is a conceptual understanding component of it. There is the fluency skill, and then there's a word problem associated with it. So if, you're, if you or a, uh, one of your uh, school administrators or your math department chair or the, the school coach is going into a classroom, I would have a paper this has three things on it, uh, uh, conceptual understanding, procedure, and word problems. And I would say, I better see all three of those every week. If I come into your class, I better see some word problems done. I'm not saying they have to be super difficult, but there has to be word problems. There has to be conceptual understanding. For example, when I teach combining like terms, people always say, LeBron, what do you mean by conceptual understanding? I said, I'll give you an example. If I say combining like terms in math, what I do is I put fruit, a picture of fruit, apples, oranges, and bananas. And I said, what is that, fruit? I, and then I put like three apples and two bananas. And they said, oh, we have three apples and two bananas. I said, well, they're all fruit. They said, yeah, but apples are different than bananas. I'm like, oh, so you're able to distinguish like terms. These things are like because they're apples and they're different from things that are bananas. So you put all the apples together, add them up. You put all the bananas together, perfect. I said, but what if you have red apples and green apples? I said, are those like terms? They said, well, they're all apples, but red is different than green. I said, oh, so you're telling me that things could look the same, but their color makes them even more distinguished. 
So if I give you an X and an X, those are like terms. But if it's X to the second power, and then the X to the third power, you're telling me that those are not like terms. They say, yeah, because that's like the green and the red. That is a concept. So from that concept, you can then move into actual uh, algebra or into polynomials, but you gotta create a bridge of understanding based on what they know to bridge it to some concept that they do understand and then bring in the mathematics. And so I would say focusing on those things and uh, as much coaching you, you can provide to those teachers to make that transition, uh, the better results uh, I think you'll see. And thank you for that question. And so now we want to look at uh, equity uh, below the neck, as we talked about. So a concept I came up with probably about 10 years ago is math is emotional. How you feel is how you learn. And almost everyone has a strong emotional response to math. You either love it, like I do, or like the rest of the world, you hate it. But it's usually one extreme or the other. I never see any other subject have such a strong emotional response evoked by people. So if you get a C on an essay, you're like, okay, I'll, I'll do better next time. You get a C on a math test, you feel like I'm a loser, I'm a failure, my life is over. And so I don't know why people have such a strong emotional response to math, but I've learned that when I deal with math students now, I start with their emotions, not with their skill level. And so keep in mind, we are not human beings having an emotional experience. We are emotional beings having a human experience. And so here's a few things I want to uh, take away that I want to share. <clears throat> One, how you feel is how you learn. Two, people don't hate math. They hate math teachers. So anytime someone tells you, oh, I hate math. No, you don't. You hate your math teacher. Because anytime someone hates their math, I said, well, why do you hate math? Because in third grade, someone told me I was dumb and she called me to the board and they laughed at me. So it's the experience. It's the math teachers who are responsible for creating the hate of the subject. So I'm like, you can't hate math but you can't hate your math teacher, but this, this association is so strong that I tell math teachers, you have to build relationship with students first. If you can't do anything, at least have kids leave with a positive identity with math. If you can't teach, at least build their confidence and let the next person try and teach it. And this is really important, especially for the online learning environment. Uh, that you don't create a lesson plan, you create a lesson experience. What do you want kids to experience? How do you want them to feel? How do you want them to respond? How do you want them to move? And especially in the online environment, you have to create an experience. Your lesson does not transfer from that boring class face-to-face -to, -face to super boring online. So the math teachers who will be successful are those who can engage their students. If you can engage your students, because now, um, if I'm in your math class online. If you're boring me to death, I just turn my camera off. I just mute you. Or I just log out. And that's not the kid's fault. That's our fault as math teachers. We, our job is to engage, to make it interesting. And it's not always easy, but it requires us to do a heavy lift. It wasn't easy for me to, uh, to learn all the Jewish holidays. It wasn't easy for me to, to, to not get homework on a Friday because of Shabbat, but I learned and I transitioned, I'm like, oh, okay, now I understand your culture. Now I adjusted how I would teach. And so um, in my experience, here are the three pillars we use in order to effectively teach math, especially in the online environment. You have to have cultural competence, know the culture of your students. You have to exhibit a growth mindset and you have to use uh, social emotional learning. And so in terms of, of cultural competence, it's about interviewing your students. That's all you gotta do, interview your students and parents. A small questionnaire can go a long way in building cultural competence. Having a growth mindset, and, and I'm, I'm kind of zooming through these, uh, but this presentation will be made available and this uh, session will also be recorded. But the one word you gotta understand from mindset is the word yet. yet is the key to success. 
So if a kid says, I can't add fractions, then you as a teacher must say, you can't add fractions yet. You can't solve for X yet. You don't know how to graph a parabola yet. But that word yet lets them know that they have time to grow, room to grow, and there's still possibility uh, for them to achieve. And then social emotional learning. You have to understand students of color are under so much stress it's unbelievable. The stress and trauma we're experiencing is unbelievable. Like, I don't even know how I'm talking to any of you right now as stressed out and traumatized as I am, thinking I can't even walk outside because I'm going to get killed by the police. And I got two black boys. I'm thinking, my son's about to go to college in Colorado. I know somebody white going to try and kill my son. So that's my current reality. But I still, we still have to persevere through it all. And so in the classroom, you have to understand that if you don't make that learning environment online or face-to-face -face friendly and inviting, then what happens is the brain will shut down into fight or flight and the prefrontal cortex will close and information cannot get in. If you tell me good morning, how are you doing? How's your family? How are you feeling? I feel safer around you. There's no need to, to protect myself. Then the prefrontal cortex opens up and all the information can get in and I can learn. Uh, and so now uh, what I want to do is sharing all that. Um, I'm now going to show you, uh, it's a five minute video. I'm probably going to show maybe about three minutes of it, but all the stuff that I'm saying and practicing, you're like, okay, LeBron, yeah, okay, I hear you. But this is a sample of the online class I've taught this summer. So I gave, as soon as COVID hit, I offered eight free weeks of algebra tutoring online. And I have anywhere from 30 to 50 kids who would come in from all over the country to take my class. And then their parents would sit in and take the class. So this is just a clip of how I would run my online class. Okay, here we go. We're ready to go. Okay, we've got nine folks in here. Here we go. So I'll put in the chat, um, let me know how you guys are feeling today on a scale of one to 10, how you're feeling. One is so-so, 10 is you're feeling fantastic. So I wanted to always do a check-in and see how everybody's doing. So hit me with how you're feeling real quick, and then we can go ahead and get it started. Oh, Blake, okay, okay. Oh, Maya, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, Tyler, I see with seven. Madison, all right. Yeah, we got to support uh, Blake today. Blake ain't feeling that great, so we're going to take care of you, all right, Blake? So um, let us know what we can do to make it better. If we need more music or some different music or some answers to some problems, let me know. Hey, 10, okay, Miguel, I see you. All right, Francisco. Here we go, Miguel. Okay, I see you with the 10. All right. Cool, cool, cool. So um, right now I'm at about a, I'm at about a 10 right now because I got to play my turn-up music. I always play a blow the whistle uh, by too short any time I start teaching math. Because with math, you have to know that math is emotional. All right? However you feel is how you're going to perform in math. So if your attitude is not good or you're not feeling high self-esteem, it's going to be hard to do math. But if you get hypey with it, get hypey, you get turned up, it's easy to do math. So you want to find your favorite kind of music, blast it in your headphones or blast it in your room when you're doing math. It makes math a lot more fun. Start looking at some of these, some of these concepts and see if there's something, something you want to see. Just type it in the chat. Boom. So I'll make sure you guys learn how to do the math. Don't let the math do you. Make sure you do the math. All right. Or you want to create a team or find a team of people to do math with. I would say three, three to five for your age range is best. If you get three to five of y'all in a group doing math together, you'll spend less time doing math, you'll learn more and you'll have more fun. So create those teams. So those are just my math man suggestions for today. And we're gonna jump knee deep into this mathematics real quick. Uh, your place of origin is only two types of people in the world. All right. One. People who are in jail and people who are out of jail. That's it. So there's only two types of people in this world. Uh, I'm guessing uh, if you any if you're anything like me, you want to be number two out of jail. All right. So the reason I say there's only two types of people is because no matter who you are, you're either free and outside of jail 
or you're locked up inside of jail. It don't matter your race, religion, um, sexual orientation, none of that matters, <clears throat> all right? So in terms of radicals, radicals are the same way, all right? When you think of radicals, you're thinking they're gonna be numbers that are in jail, and there's gonna be numbers that are out of jail. Now remember, people in jail can only do things with other people in jail, right? So you can hang out, talk, uh, play ball, whatever. So people in jail hang out with people in jail, and people out of jail, they hang out with other people who are out of jail. All right, so now let's apply that to radicals. Boom, radical X, all right? So X is in jail. Anything under the radical, we call that in jail. As you can imagine, this is a jail cell. So if X is in jail, if I multiply it by radical Y, then since they're both in jail, we can multiply them. So that's the same as X times Y. So if X is in a in cell, in, in a prison cell, Y is in jail, then they can both, we can put them both in the same cell, doesn't matter, because they're both in jail. But now if you have <clears throat> A times the square root of B, here A is in jail, A is out of jail, I'm sorry, A is out of jail, B's in jail. So if we want to multiply it, say, by C square root D, then we say, okay, we see that B is in jail and D is in jail, but A is free and C is free. So who can we multiply? We can multiply A times C because people out of jail hang out with other people out of jail. And then B times D have to be under the radical because they're in jail. So I just wanted to give, uh, to share that short snippet of, uh, of, of, of teaching. So everything I, I talked about in terms of the ethno-mathematics, asking kids the kind of music they like, starting a class off with the music they like, using examples. And so the radicals would be that conceptual understanding. So they understand the concept of jail, being in or being out. And so then after teaching that, using that example for 15 years, kids automatically know radicals. And so they know, okay, boom, in, out, so that I create a framework for them. And so when I'm talking about positive and negative numbers, I talk about bloods and crips. How many bloods and crips do we have? Or the biggest gang in the country is the Democrats and Republicans. So if I got 10 Democrats and 15 Republicans, I say, who's there more of? There goes more Republicans by five. But if I said 10 minus 15, kids couldn't figure that out. Uh, what? Uh, 10. So under putting, creating positive negative numbers in terms of, of opposites that they understand, men and women, uh, bloods and crips, um, Democrats, Republicans, and I never use anything basic and simple. I use something shocking. That's why I use jail as the, as the context for radicals, because it's a shock to the system. I get their attention. Now they want to listen. So it's not about, for me, being politically correct. For me, it's engaging students and giving something that they can hold on to, something that's going to stick in their mind. And then I ask them, you come up with your own examples. You give me different ones. And so kids would come up with their own, but, but they're thinking conceptually, which is what I'm trying to get them to do. Um, and so I will, I will, I'm going to save at least five minutes at the end. So if you have questions, I'm going to let everybody uh, speak or share towards the end. I just want to make sure I get through uh, the rest of the content here. And so looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I'm sure uh, most all of you understand or familiar with, the needs, I look at the needs of the teacher and student primarily, because as teachers, you have needs and are your needs being met? Uh, and too often in uh, a situation in urban communities, the teacher's needs or, or concerns are about self-esteem and safety. And so they're always trying to control students. Sit down, don't move, don't breathe, shut up. I mean, it's, it's controlling, but it's not a learning environment. And so once you feel safe, then it's okay to teach. But for the students, they're not afforded that same, uh, that same opportunity. And so, uh, what we end up doing is we do this, uh, this woe is me, poor child thing where we look for kids' safety needs, uh, 
uh, psychological need and we try to pamper them and coddle them. And then we turn around and stab them in the back and say, you're three years behind in math. Why? Because you didn't take them up here to the self-esteem, to the self-actualization up here at the top of hierarchies, uh, Maslow's hierarchy. This is where the higher level thinking skills are. Here's where the determination is. Determination is. So when I start kids, I start my class with self-actualization and esteem. All of y'all are mathematicians. How you feeling, Blake? How you doing? Oh, Miguel, you doing great. Oh, man, y'all, y'all doing great. Let's do this. So I start up here and flip this thing around because I know, because I grew up poor. Because I grew up poor, I don't want to talk about poor. I don't, I don't need you to, to tell me uh, everything's going to be okay. I don't need you to fill me with the bullshit. I need you to help me learn. So believe I'm a mathematician and help me with the self-esteem because that's what I need to get to the next level of the mathematics. Now we want to look at uh, equity above the next. So we talked about the emotional part. Now we're going to get to the intellectual part of it. So how do we increase student learning? Here we have the, uh, the pyramid of retention. So you see that if you do lectures, students retain 5% of what you say. And what do most teachers do? You talk to your blue in the face. You stand up there and you yap, 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 yap making yourself smarter because you're the one talking and kids are not engaged and they're not learning. So we want to be, um, so what we want to do is we want to increase student talk. Your kids should be talking more than you're talking if you want them to learn. Kids should be working on problems, collaborating more so than you are. In, in my class, I have a rule that I'm only talking 15 to 20 minutes after that, the rest of the class has to be activity. So whatever I can't get done in 15, 20 minutes, that's my bad. But the rest of the time, kids working, kids doing stuff, and I'm just walking around answering questions because if I talk, only I learn. And then also in math, we got to let kids fail fast and fail often. You have to create an environment where kids understand that failure and being wrong is the natural part of being a mathematician. You only become better at math by doing more problems and being wrong more often than you're right. Kids understand that with video games, they lose all day long in video games. Self-esteem is intact. But they get a, a bad grade on a quiz in your class, now they feel demoralized or you make them feel demoralized. So we have to change the context of, of how math is done. So I strongly encourage I want to focus that if you're teaching online or face-to-face, -face, how can I create more discussion in my class? How can I get kids doing more practice? And how can I get them working together, teaching each other? How can I put the strong kid with the weak kid and put them in the breakout room? And then I just sit and monitor and watch what happens in dynam dynamics that go on in that room. Because less is more. The less we talk, the less kids will learn, especially in terms of mathematics. And so now um, you've, you've seen a sample of, of, of my teaching methodology. And so um, in our face-to-face -face class, we do a program for students called Master Student where we train them how to be A students in math. And, and I'm now transferring the same program to the online environment. And so I want you to hear the testimony of three students and, and what they thought about the program. Uh, first, we made sure that the program was interactive learning, that they were the focus, not us. Then we made sure that the, the room was a culturally affirming environment. That when they came in, it felt like home. It felt like family. It didn't feel like something foreign. And for most students, when they walk into a classroom in any school in this country, it feels like a foreign experience. Like you'll see kids in the hallway, they'll be laughing and talking. As soon as they walk in your class, they shut down. You can ask them a simple question. They act like they don't know how to respond because we don't make the classroom the real world. And so when you create a division between real life and classroom, kids have to shift between those and they don't see the connection. They don't see the meaning in learning, which is why, even though I would get in trouble every year for my principal for keeping it real, that I said, when a kid comes in my class, it's going to be like the real world. You know what I mean? So if you come in like, LeBron, I said, uh, I can do my homework. I said, man, you full of shit. They're like, oh, what? I said, wait a minute. I just heard you in the hallway say that your friend was full of shit. Well, I'm different. Like this is this room is different than the 10 feet. We, come on now. 
But when you create reality with kids, they don't rebel more. They respect you more, and then it becomes a norm. They don't, they don't, they cuss less when they hear you cuss because they realize, oh, you're a real human being. And I said, now you know that was wrong what you said out there. He said, but I can discipline after I keep it real. I can't pretend like you're different than me. I'm gonna talk to you the same way your parents gonna talk to you. And that's how you build relationship. And I do the same thing in the online environment. And then you have to make math competitive. Come on, people, you know, we live in a capitalistic society. You've got to use competition. And kids in the hood want to compete. They want to compete. Now, it's amazing when we have them compete and we play a game called the MFL, the Math Football League. They're competing. They're talking trash. They're teasing each other, but about math. We say, oh, fool, you don't even know how to factor a polynomial. Who, what kid's going to talk trash to another kid over factoring polynomial? But it, they're so engaged that it's not about the math, it's the competition and the math is coming in underneath. So I don't even make math the subject matter. It's the competition that we focus on. And so I wanted to share just the, the clips of what these uh, three students have to say, and then I'll take your, your questions and comments. Uh, my name is Michael, I've been here for all six weeks. And something I liked about the master student program is that we learn more than just math. We learn about like, how to mentally, be positive how to work around people how to work with people and at the same time how to work by yourself um i liked it a lot i learned a lot my grades have been improving like a little bit and then i've just been spending more time like being positive speaking life not death you know and i recommend it to everyone my name is josiah and i've been here for about three weeks for the master's student program uh one thing that i learned here is that that what that hit me personally is probably the hard work that not only you do in math but in life in general and how everything's kind of competition no matter what it is the work ethic in it you can be as great as that person too if you have the talent whatever in sports and just in general in life my name is freddie um, i've been here for all six weeks and what i like a lot of i like almost everything about the program but i really like like on the first day you know music was playing I see my peers in here, and it's not like you enter the regular classroom where, like, you know, off the bat, like, I already felt like a family in here because, like, the environment was really cool. So then, like, with a cool environment, I was able to learn a lot, you know? And it was like, we were in here, and, like, we was learning, and he was teaching us things, like, not even just strictly math, but, like, things about life. Like, just, you know, we would have, like, these conversations about things that, like, wouldn't even be on math, but it'd be, like, things that help me in my everyday life that I need to do to do math or school in general. So I feel like after these six weeks, I feel like I'm a way better scholar. I feel like a scholar and um, I recommend it to everybody. It's really dope. And so um, uh, those are just three, three of the students uh, uh, because I think it's important that we see or, or hear students' voices. So we could talk theory and concepts all day long, but my report card is them. I don't care what the faculty say. I don't care what evaluation I get. All I care about is those students. What is their experience when they leave my class? How do they feel about themselves? What skills are they gonna have in their backpack when they leave my room? And so as educators, we gotta sort of shift to understand that what is the most important part of this work we're doing. And in terms of mathematics, I sell it to them. I sell them on the benefit, how this is gonna save your life if you learn how to problem solve. You know that there's a routine the police always do when they pull you over. You gotta understand that pattern. You gotta figure out your strategy. Okay, how am I gonna deal with this cop? What do I have to do? So it's constantly thinking and problem solving, but kids aren't aware that they're doing it. So I just tell them what they're already doing. I tell them the calculus you're doing, well, when you see, the, when the, you see those lights go on in, in the back, I tell them that the algebra they're doing, the calculations that they're making in their mind of, okay, now I got to deal with the police, but now I got to deal with the gang in the hood. Now I got to deal with these other people. So we're constantly dealing and solving problems at all times. So you can't tell me there's a, any kid in the hood who ain't a mathematician. Trust and believe. They're not, they'll be practicing the formal method, but if you talk to them and you unpack what they're doing, you see that they're doing high level mathematics 24 steps. And so uh, now I want to, for the last few minutes, to, to open it up to, uh, to any questions or comments uh, anyone would like to make. And then uh, in Africa, if you see a couple of 
questions someone may ask that you can feel free to bring those up um yeah, well. yeah well, I'll, do, I'll just say while waiting for like the chat to populate I love love mm -hmm. seeing so much love in the chat too for student voice and being able to hear from the students and for you to say the students are your report card like a lot of love for that the other thing I was going to say too is that a couple of years ago I got to be at the um coalition of schools educating boys of color Coles box annual Coles box, yeah yeah and so I'm like and they had like it was kind of like Chris Emden the work he does around like science genius and rap battles based on science like I yes. can't even begin to talk about how amazing that is. And it's, it just shows like what our kids are capable of and when given the opportunity to like bring themselves into the content, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of resonance too, like so powerful, so many good, mess good messages. Um, could you talk about teaching math to girls and women? That's one of the recent, the most recent. Uh, oh, questions. yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the person who asked that question. So when I was, uh, uh, the, all the time that I was in the classroom, I always made sure I had the girls sit in my front row. So the first thing I would say day one is all you young ladies are going to be mathematicians, period. And so the research I found was that girls struggled in higher level mathematics because in elementary and middle school, the teachers would tend to coddle the girls and give them the answers and think that they were being nice and supportive, but they didn't allow the girls to struggle and to, to have to persevere and to, and to get problems wrong and, and have grit. And so it was hurting the girls at the higher level band. So I made sure that I was uh, more intensely involved with the girls in my class and made sure I gave them the harder problems, make them grit. And they were crying, we hate you, LeBron. You're so mean to us. I'm like, you're damn right. But you're going to leave a mathematician in June. I don't know what you are right now in September, but when I get through with you, you're going to be a mathematician. And so having that experience, uh, I had almost, I would say probably 80, 90% of the, the girls in my class were earning A in my class. And most of them had never had an A in math, but I showed them how to persevere. I showed them how to have grit. How do you look at a problem? I said, look, look, we're going to kill, see them boys over there? We're going to kill them on this next test. All right. And we're going to take it and shove it in their face. And so that kind of, you know, they knew that I was on their side, on their team, but I'm on every student's team. But just the way I would pull the girls to the side, I go to the, to the boys and say, look, boys, look, you know them girls is clowning you, right? Y'all better get your stuff together. And then I go to my black and Latino students and say, look, you know we ain't going to let these white folks get out of here with a higher grade than us. You know that, right? So I'm always using every single angle I can with every group to create all these different alliances to let every student know I'm on your team. And so the competition is always something else. It's not you against the mass. It's me and you in the math against somebody else. And that's the context I would always try to create in the classroom. There was another question that came through, and I guess this could be our last okay. question as we, unless you want to go ahead and wrap up, I'll let you, because the other folks can no, Yeah. Yeah, you can do one more. We'll do one more. Uh -huh. Okay. So the question is, what would you recommend for teachers whose culture does, like, to make sure it's authentic learning when your, your culture doesn't match that of your students? Any advice for that? Right. Fantastic question. Just as my culture did not match the Jewish culture in which I taught. And so I had to become a student of Jewish culture. And so I would talk to the rabbis at least once a month to say, rabbis, can you give me some ideas, some things? And then I talked to the, uh, the teacher who would teach uh, Jewish law, talk to them. I talked to the parents. Uh, then I said, hey, can I come to, to, the, to the bar mitzvah? Uh, to the bar mitzvah. I get invitations. I go. I say, can I come to Shabbat dinner? I would go there. We do the prayer. We break the challah. I put on, I put my yarmulke on. Don't get it twisted. I was all the way in, baby. I was all the way in. So if I'm a teacher, if that's the culture, I'm all the way, I'm, I'm, I'm buying in. I got my star David. I'm like, I'm rocking the whole thing. Because if you're a teacher and you really care about your students, you'd be willing to do that for your students. And so are you willing uh, to play, to play music in your class for your students? Are you willing to, to, to talk does and take five minutes? Let's all, you, we all bag on each other and talk trash. Are you going to be willing uh, to let them say amen? Are you going to include call and response in your class? Are you going to make the class feel culturally responsive to your, to your students? And if you're a teacher, you will do that. If you don't do that, I don't know. I wouldn't call you a teacher, but you are hired to do that. But teachers, we have to do what we have to do to support our students. It ain't about us. And so, um, uh, in wrapping up, I want to just thank everyone uh, who participated. 
uh, in our discussion today. Um, hopefully you found one or two things useful. Uh, my email address is, is on the screen. Uh, this presentation will also be posted. And uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please let me know. And uh, take care of yourselves, teachers and educators. Be well during this time. Uh, and like I tell it, like I said, uh, when I was in graduate school at Harvard, they said, what can we do uh, to support uh, black kids, black and brown kids during the struggle? I said, if you see somebody black, give them a hug. You ain't even got to know them, just give them a hug. I was in Malibu yesterday in Malibu, California, and there was over 100 white people with Black Lives Matter sign in Malibu. I've never seen that in my life. I've seen Amish people with Black Lives Matter sign. So I'm, I, we appreciate the love and the support. And so the, man, you, know, you won't have all the answers if you're not black, but man, if you just say hello, I feel you, or give somebody a hug, look, put the mask on, look. I'm not scared of COVID-19, I'm scared of the police. So if you white, you come up to me and give me a hug, I'm gonna give you a hug, okay? Because I ain't scared of COVID, I'm scared of the police. So I just wanted to throw that out there and say, once again, thank you all uh, for attending. I wanna thank you all too. I mean, this has been, it's such a pleasure. Like I really feel like it's a privilege for me like to, to, to be in the role of host because I learned so much too. So thank you so much for those of you in the chat. If you haven't seen in the chat, I dropped the links to the survey to the Ask the Experts portal if you have additional questions. And then also, as LeBron mentioned, the resources will be available on the website. I dropped that link in there as well. And so you'll be able to see the recording of today's session as in addition to the slide deck, which this was marvelous. So thank you so much, LeBron. Thank you everyone who was here today. And I really wish everyone stay safe, take care of yourselves and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.